Sure. Oh, well, first, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about the exhibition. Um, I love the title, Uncommon Threads, because um, I think that's pretty much it sums it up uh, for me that the threads that you know create the characters, the threads that create the individuals are uncommon. And that's my pursuit in every project that I have is to find the most uncommon threads that make up the costume design, that make up the character, uh, the character arcs, that make up the people. They are uncommon threads. And um, I wish it, it could be as simple as fashion or as simple as buying clothes off the rack. But, you know, the mentors whom I uh, followed were the storytellers. They were, you know, they were not your uh, fashion designers. I was not a, a young lady that played with Barbies. I, I actually sat down at the sewing machine and tried to go away from the pattern and do something uncommon and I never wanted to wear anything I made though. Uh, that was the, the fun part, I guess, uh, it was the journey of, of, of creating these things. So um, I guess through going to uh, school and, and having mentors uh, that were artists, also like reading the works of, you know, uh, James Baldwin and you know, you, you can't read prose like mother to child and not visualize the struggle of a single, mother, single parent in that uh, story, in that poem uh, that James Baldwin wrote. So I was fascinated by stories of people because I could see them. I could see them in my mind. And when I got an opportunity to create a character, you know, I sought out the uncommon thread. I sought out the thing that I thought would make them the most unique or would bring them off the page as so that everyone could enjoy the layers that made up that poem, the layers that made that person live so vibrantly within that story. So, you know, as a storyteller, that's what I consider myself. As a textile artist, I consider myself that person who uses the textiles, who uses the, the uncommon threads and creates the magic of characters in film. And so when you've been working with these different artists, did you ever have the opportunity? So one of the things that you used was indigo. Yes. Uh, so we have a piece here uh, and as part of the exhibition that was dyed with indigo. Yes. So my, d did you get your arms down inside the vat? Did you have purple oh, arms? I wish. I mean, I had those like uh, dyed fingertips like my whole college experience. You know, I'd go out and go out to like lunch with my friends and their nails would be done beautifully and my hands would be blue and I'd have to hide them. But um, I just think that there is always a industry that traces us back to our roots. Um, and, you know, if you dig, if you look close enough, you'll find it in your lineage. And I felt like when I did reboot, I'm um, sorry, when I did Roots reboot, that I could use the process of creating this indigo dye that was a part of the, the villages in Sierra Leone where some of the Africans were taken and brought to America and that I could keep that going as a family color because they could also harvest a, and create indigo within the, the compounds of uh, the slave uh, squares. And I could even take it further than that as we go through the generations. So, I used blue, uh, the indigo color, as a part is of the, you know, the Haley uh, story. Um, I just imposed that color in there. And that, that was thrilling to me because I, I, I felt like it was sublime. Like, you may not have noticed, but if you heard me say this and you went back, you would see a lot of blue going along the journey. So my question, that came to me while you were talking was, what does it take for you to create a story of the characters that you're doing the costumes for? 
do you, oh. do you, how much time do you spend creating that story? Yeah. Does it just come to you mm -hmm. like a flash or? No, I wish it came to me like a flash. I'd be rich, <laughs> but it doesn't. And it takes a while and I, I'm continuously doing it. So uh, production usually lasts in preparation for anywhere from 10, 12 weeks. That's like three months. And then we shoot it over three months. So in six months you have a movie, um, which is not enough time to research about a family or a story or a place. It's not enough time to create a world. So you're constantly doing it. It's, it, it actually uh, is one of those uh, professions that takes over your life for six months and you're not thinking about anything else. I mean, I like, I like lay down on my pillow and say, now, okay, now think how you're gonna solve that problem. And then I wake up in the morning and I'm like, hey, miraculously, I have a solution. And I think it's my mind has a chance to rest and the solution comes to me just from, you know, having been able to just take, take it easy. So um, I'm like constantly uh, thinking about it because I only have one chance. Once that, once that fabric or that costume is in front of the camera, that's it. I can't change it. I call those 3 a.m. moments. Ah, I know exactly what yes. you mean. You're like, 3 a.m. moments. How do I solve it? And your brain is empty enough yes. for it to kind of unravel. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I do understand that. <laughs> so I'm curious then if you're, old, so as you mentioned, three months to, to kind of think about it before you, you actually go to begin mm -hmm. filming. Mm -hmm. When we think about a film like Black Panther, where there were so many different mm -hmm. costumes, mm -hmm. did they give you a little bit more time? Oh yeah, I Great. had a little more time, but not much more. Um, I, I started Black Panther in June. Uh, we went to camera in January. So that was the prep time. There's a lot of uh, builds uh, we call specialty builds. You know, when you see super suits, um, it's just not, you know, making a leotard for someone. You know, we have to do a muscle sculpt and we have to understand the body proportions. We want to we want to manipulate them and change them by giving them a muscle suit underneath that. And then there is the suit that goes on top. And, you know, you think that that stretch fabric, you know, hey, you know, it's stretch fabric. How hard is that? But we also have a pattern on it. We have a panther necklace and we have gloves that are interfaced with the suit. So all of that has to be designed very carefully so that things lay where they're supposed to lay when it stretches over that muscle suit. So there's a big process and that goes on for everything, you know, the door melage, everything has its own special layers, which are very time consuming and very specialized. I've never really thought about how you take apart a costume mm -hmm. and figure out how to make it work. Yes. So I appreciate you explaining that because I enjoy seeing them, mm -hmm. but I would have never thought about muscle Muscle sculpt. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I need a D world. muscle sculpt for my superhero suit. If there was such a thing, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's really interesting because as, as I was looking at some of the sketches that we have on here in the exhibition, mm -hmm. you um, somebody I think perhaps you made a note that during the fight scene, a different type of shoe was going to go on to the character. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about times where um, you have to, whether the director or whatever the script requires to yes. make these kind of edits, how do you work that into your vision where you already, like this was Well, the, the vision is laid out. I yeah. mean, there, it, you know, the Panther suit was created by Jack Kirby, Kirby and Stan Lee back in the 60s. So, you know, the cat suit hasn't really changed that much over the years, mm -hmm. but actually the specialized movements and, and specialty uh, martial arts, Different people wear them. Uh, we have a stunt guy that wears them. We have the actor that wears them. Um, and they all have different foot requirements. So if you are a karate expert, you want to actually maybe have more of a tabby boot or a boxing boot inside of the panther suit. If you are more comfortable with an all-terrain shoe, then that's what goes in. And so that's allowing the actor or the stunt performer to actually perform at their best. And um, so we accommodate all of that. But in Marvel, uh, the Marvel Universe, there's something called visual effects. Uh, and that's, you know, in our, in our advantage because um, just, uh, for example, Chaz, Chadwick Boseman couldn't breathe out of his nose with the, pan with the helmet on, the late Chadwick Boseman. 
Um, and we decided to make a little uh, hat door hat that came off of the front of the mask. And most of the time when he was doing anything of rigorous, he had an open place in the front of the mask and visual effects and post, put it back on. So there's a lot we don't see. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sometimes a lot of these experts can pick out when um, the scene goes from being real to animated. Uh, there's some flips and things that happen that are completely animated. And uh, that's the movie magic of it all. But most films don't have all of that. Uh, most films are shot straight ahead and performers performing their, their best in costumes like real life. I'm trying to think of different movies I want to ask you about. Mm. So I guess you most recently did Coming to America too. Yes. So did you take any kinds of I'll say cues or anything from the first coming to America to design something? Sure. I looked at the first movie quite a bit because that was the one everyone remembers. And then I realized most people remember like the best parts of it. You know, they don't remember all of the details. And when I looked at it, I said, okay, I can bring back the essence that people remember and love about the first movie. Uh, you know, the, the guys in the barbershop. And so I made that look exactly like it did in the first movie. Uh, the wedding dress, the big wedding dress at the end. Most people remember that. So we made sure we had a big wedding dress at the end of ours. Uh, people remember the op opulence. Uh, you know, how the women wore the big uh, African pattern dresses, the Ankara fabric with big shapes and big galas. They remember the spectacle. So I said, okay, I can do a spectacle. And then I said, now there's a more sophisticated audience here. And there's also an audience that, you know, are, is younger and don't really, really remember the first one. So we can actually make this a continuation and more sophisticated. You know, I went from Wakanda to Zamunda. So I have an advantage in that I've done a little research already and I can, I can make it feel like a real place. Um, on the first movie, we were more in New York. Uh, in Coming to America 2, we were most so, mostly in Zamunda, which we didn't really see that much of Zamunda in the first movie. So I was able to actually kind of create that world, which was really fun. And I incorporated a lot of, you know, smaller designers that wouldn't necessarily have a platform like a big movie to show their, show their fashions. And that was great. I mean, it's like over three dozen designers that I, that I collaborated with. So I, I think that would bring up another question about mentorship. How important is mentorship for you to have a mentor and also be a mentor? Well, my mentors were so amazing. Um, and, you know, I guess when you have a good mentor, you never forget them. You, you kind of, they live within you. Like, they're part of your, like, protection. Like, when you think about a really great mentor in your life, it's somebody that you just go, I can do this because my mentor told me, you know, I can, uh, you know, I can be this because my mentor gave me this knowledge like your mentor like lives inside of you so mentorship for me means that maybe i will live inside somebody else for the rest of their life and i will inspire them to be the best at whatever whatever it is that i'm inspiring them to do so it's very important to me i mean i i can't do what my mentor did to for me in terms of i was her student and i was in her plays and she you know guided me through my schooling because i'm in the professional sector but if my movies movies inspire you if if what i say inspires you um, I feel like that's the space that I'm in right now in, in my career because I've got over 35 years of doing I've never had any other job. I mean, I drove an ice cream truck in high school. I mean, in, not in high school, in college for one summer. That, that was it. So mentorship means everything. It means everything. To be able to have someone in your life say, you can do that. When sometimes nobody else is saying that to you, 
it means everything. Yeah. It really does. It really does. And I think about, especially when you're, for, for perhaps a lot of people out there, um, it's, it's the creative classes in school that yeah. you really, you really find your home and you find that space where you, you can be yourself, yeah. whether it's the, the band room or, or theater or, or the, the art class. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just why it's so important that Very important. whether you have it in school or, or have the opportunity to do it outside of school sure. um, to continue to pursue that. Yeah. And parents don't think that the arts is a viable career choice. You know, they go, oh, yeah, that's nice. I'm, I'm really happy that you did a nice drawing. But what are you going to study in school when you go to college or whatever? And um, I started out in special education because I thought, you know, I could be a teacher. But I kept being drawn to the theater. And then my mom was like, so that means I'm going to see you on the news. You're going to be you're going to not on the news, but you're going to be like broadcasting as a news reporter. And I was like, no, I'm going to be a costume designer. And she was thinking, I know she was thinking, what the heck is that? But um, I, she came to a play that I, w I was an intern at Stage, w Stage West here in Springfield, Mass. And my mom said, OK, so you graduated from college, and now you are working backstage and then doing laundry. I was like, but not for long. <laughs> so I think parents you know, need to be kind of uh, 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 shown, hopefully by my example, that you can make a living and be in the arts. You can have a life and be an artist. So um, that's also something that I'm happy to present. I, I took that from meeting you and also seeing some of the interviews, because as an African-American, we don't get exposed to a lot of different occupations. True. So for you to be doing this, you're exposing so many people to opportunities that they would have never thought about, yeah. taken advantage of, and they know that you have blazed that trail. Yes. And you can be their mentor, even if it's just saying you two can open this door. And yes. Walk through. So in that way, I am the uncommon thread. Right. I'm the one that can show you that it doesn't have to be common. It doesn't have to be uh, norm. It could be actually very uncommon and, and, and your own choice, your own personal choice. You just have to pursue excellence. Yeah, one of the things that's really stuck with me that I am going to always use as a mantra is just, I'm going to get a PhD in me as well. Oh, yeah. And I just think that I, it, it's, such, it's, it's such a, I mean, I love that poem, but I, that particular line where I was like, you know what? Yeah. Because we're talking about education and in the pursuit of education and continuing yeah. to do that no matter how old you yeah. are. But it's, and I think that's something that we think back about the past years. We've hopefully at least all gotten a BFA or, or a BA or an MA or whatever in ourselves, but to, mm -hmm. to really dig deep um, sure. into your own psyche. Yes, and really study yourself. Like, like I said, be a, a student of your passion. Really um, take it on. Um, it's a lifelong pursuit. Even when you graduate from college, you're still going to have to study your craft. You're still going to be a student of your passion because, you know, what else makes life worth living but to study something that you're passionate about? Right. Yeah. I think that's so important to be a lifelong learner. And mm -hmm. most people don't realize that, that you can always learn something new. You can yeah. always make something better. You can never be at the end of it. You can just keep moving forward. Yes, yes. Oh. And then you pass it on. I think because it's continuous. You never say, oh, yeah, well, I know everything. I'm never going to know everything. There's always a new story. There's always a new journey. Um, and, but, you know, there may come a time when, you know, hey, I want to lecture now. And someone else comes up as a costume designer. And they get some amazing script like Black Panther. And they do an amazing job. And they can say, you know, they were inspired by Ruth Carter. Or they were inspired by Sharon Davis or, you know, anybody out there. So. I feel like we're always like moving the needle forward. We're always trying to present a really positive uh, uh, image of what it is that we are doing so that the next person can take it to another level. And I'm excited about that for up and coming designers. You know, I, I hope that people, you know, uh, understand my, my journey 
and can take it to the next step. I don't expect anybody to do what I did, you know, because the times are different. I feel like I'm like that parent that's like, yes, I had to walk a mile with one pair of shoes to school. Yeah, but it is kind of like that, you know. Sure. Well, the, you know, a lot of it is, as you're saying to that time, it's like that it's the handshake deal. It's like, well, you're, you're a hard worker. All right, let's, let's get you going. That doesn't matter what your qualifications are. It's a, it's a little trickier for, I think, people to, to kind of break through into things. And so, yeah, it is. Um, as you mentioned about, you know, never stopping our learning, uh, my question to you, in, in the world of pandemic, you had a little bit of downtime. Mm-hmm. Did, you, did you learn anything new? Did you, what did you do? Did you, did you get into, dive back into painting? Or? I did. Yeah. yeah. I did. did. I went on uh, Blick's uh, website. And I ordered, They thank God they didn't all come in because I was going crazy. I ordered like six canvases that were six feet by four feet. And uh, three of them came in. It was really hard to get things on order during COVID. You know, there was like one email after another saying your, your stuff is delayed. Well, while my canvases were coming, oh, and then I was ordering new brushes and paints and I went online and I was in YouTube University, completely <laughs> YouTube University for paint, oil paint. So now I have, you know, some guys I follow and girls that I follow. And then I took, I, I ordered a paint class um, called the Bold School Painters. I think she's in Providence, actually, at the Rhode Island School, maybe mm-hmm. Rhode Island uh, School of Arts. Yeah, the Rhode Island School. Yes, yeah. yes, yep. Art and Design. Yep. And um, I just like so got into drawing and painting. I loved it. And I had all the time in the world. It was like being freed from responsibility (laughs) and and, and just able, I was able to relax finally because I have just been a real uh, soldier in the world of costume design. Like I love it so much I could do it every year. I was doing maybe three movies a year, two and a half movies a year for like 12 years straight. And then, then they started giving me longer production time. So I would just take maybe two months off and that was it. For 35 years, I went on vacation a few times, but for the most part, I was a costume designer nonstop. So I didn't know how devastating the pandemic would be. But when it first happened, we had already stacked, stocked up enough you know, paper towels and toilet paper. We, we weren't all that worried about that. And I just looked at it as I could finally re- relax and really I, I connected to a lot of my artistic um, desires that, you know, I think if I wasn't a costume designer, I would probably be another type of an artist. Mm. And um, that was the, just the, the, the most, some people got into cooking during COVID. They learned a lot of recipes or they baked a lot of pa- pastries and stuff. I painted every day. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's, I love to hear people say that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say the same. I was busy keeping this organization open. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I did a lot of, because I had a lecture series that I was out uh, doing, mm-hmm. and it all got shut down, but then they started, I started doing lectures on Zoom. So I did a lot of, I did commencement speeches and stuff like that all on Zoom. I have a whole lighting set up in my office, and it's crazy. I think all of us, took, those are the new skills we all had to learn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. How to be, present yourself in a virtual reality. In a virtual world, yeah. Yeah. I so, dug it. So what are you working on now? Are you, You're doing Black Panther 2. Yeah, we're in um, Atlanta uh, prepping for it. It's a big film, obviously. It's bigger than the first one. And uh, a lot of moving parts. And so... Um, yeah, like, you know, that's what I'm doing now. And that's all I'm really focused on. I do uh, appreciate having to the opportunity to come here and have this exhibit open, you know, while I'm in Atlanta. Um, it, it, it's nice to see a part of you living in the world. And um, so this is nice. Excellent. Well, you know, we were we were very thrilled in 2019 <laughs> when we when we contacted yeah. your your team and everything, and, and we're just thrilled that you know at the end of the day here we are. Um, it, you know, everything was able to happen, and mm-hmm. uh, and I'm just really I just want to acknowledge our partners. I think that we you know, we had 12 different curators wow. uh, pull this exhibition together, and, and, nice. and you'll get to, you'll 
course, get to meet all of them. But, uh, you know, it's just, just been such a really big collaborative effort. And I'm going to just toot the New Bedford boat horn for, for, for a second because we are, we are just a collaborative city. And, and I hope that you've had a chance to see some of the murals and just kind of get the, the vibe of, of what this is and how we are really driven by arts and culture here. Mm -hmm.